Awesome. So welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're going to go over private lender insights into the marketplace. And before we hand it off to our awesome presenters, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. We definitely encourage you to ask questions. So there's going to be two ways that you can do that. You want to make sure that you're looking at the bottom of your screen and there's going to be a chat function there um, or a Q&A option. So you can choose either one. We'll be monitoring them and definitely answering your questions today. And with that said, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dean. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marie. We are really excited to kick off what we hope to be this uh, Insight into the Marketplace series. My name is Dean Quiambo, Chief Relationship Partner here at Armanino. Uh, we're a top 21 CPA firm in the country. One of our largest niches is real estate, and we love working with private lenders. We work with over 100 across the country. Kevin. Hey guys, uh, Kevin Kim here, uh, partner here at Jirasi LLP. For those of you who don't know us, we are a law firm based in Orange County. We serve the whole country and we are specifically focused on serving the private lending industry. Um, I manage the firm's corporate and securities division. So fund formation, securities compliance, corporate transactions, mortgage licensing, and so on. Uh, really excited to be here and hopefully uh, we're going to have, we're gonna have a good time. And I really hope I see a lot of familiar names and faces on this list. So please ask, ask your questions away and uh, let's uh, have our esteemed guest introduce himself, Kurt. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kurt Altig. I'm the founder of uh, Builders Capital. We are a uh, nationwide private construction lender based here in Seattle, Washington. And uh, Excited to be a part of this today. So looking forward to a great interaction. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, let's get to it, Kurt. Why don't um, you kind of talk to us about how, how 2020 has been for you? How's it going, you know, the pivot? Let's, let's kind of get into it. You bet, you bet. Well, 2020 has certainly been a, uh, unlike I think what probably all of us expected, right? We came into the year uh, really gaining momentum uh, through the third and fourth quarter of last year, uh, had our most significant business plan in the 11 year history of the company coming into 2020, got through the first two months. Uh, we were off to a great start. And then of course, as we all know, uh, COVID uh, descended upon us. And it has been a um, it has been a really interesting year. It is not uh, is not gone as uh, we probably would have expected if we were sitting here on March fifteenth. Um, you know, uh, some very interesting dynamics have taken place in the market. Most notably, the fact that the single single family space has continued to be incredibly robust. Other than probably a forty five, maybe sixty day kind of pause there, end of March through April. Uh, the market has performed really, really well. And as a business, we it has been a series of uh, kind of assess what's going on, uh, make adjustments where we need to make them and execute. And as we come into the, what are we, start of the fourth quarter, end of, end of the third quarter, now into the fourth quarter, uh, we have really high expectations uh, for the balance of this year and, of course, into 2021. Oh, that sounds really, really good. Um, how, I, I guess one of, one of my first questions, Kev, um, Kurt, is, you know, you said that uh, single family, is it, is it the same places as before or have you seen any kind of migration in pockets when it comes to single family with regards to geography? You bet. So there is certainly a significant, I think, movement across the country uh, with respect to what I'll call secondary markets. And secondary, by secondary, I only mean in terms of population size. And in fact, I use that uh, somewhat loosely in that uh, from small markets uh, such as Twin Falls, Idaho, Eugene, Oregon, uh, all the way to larger Again, secondary cities like Boise, Idaho, Colorado Springs, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, et cetera, uh, are under significant pressure. But I would tell you that even in our larger cities, I mean, it's pretty well documented the issues 
that Seattle, uh, and I mean the city of, specifically has had over the last six months uh, with some unrest at the end of May and into June. Portland has been under siege for what, you know, almost four or five straight months now. And yet, even in those cities, the data around the single family space continues to be unbelievable. Just to give you a quick statistic, in Seattle, or excuse me, in Puget Sound, which of course includes Seattle, last month we had 125% absorption of all standing inventory of single family. So started the month with roughly 9,500 units and sold 11,000. So I think the, the story that it tells is that the single family real estate market nationally, not in every market, but in most markets is so, um, has such small inventory in relationship to the demand that you're almost not seeing the bumps and bruises that one would expect to see when you have situations like you have in Portland, Oregon, you know, right now. Uh, the demand is so high and the inventory is so low and interest rates are so favorable that it continues to just propel the market despite uh, the other obstacles. Now, Kurt, with your experience and your crystal ball, is this something that you're seeing as just a, is this a pendulum swing, right? Is this a, is this a COVID overreaction or is this the trend that is actually really starting to build now? You know, I, I, I certainly think that we will continue to see some um, either less in migration or out migration from some of the core cities. And again, I mean, downtown Chicago, downtown Seattle, uh, that is not to suggest that those single family markets uh, will, will turn upside down or experience significant distress because again, the inventory is so low. But I believe that there are, that this is not a, a necessarily a COVID overreaction. I believe that the key driver right now, frankly, is low interest rates. I think interest rates are the one thing that can be the great equalizer in the markets. And if you see a uh, I don't, I, I, my crystal ball isn't so clear as to suggest what that might be, but 100, 150, 200 basis point adjustment in conforming interest rates, I think would certainly have an impact on the market because it affects uh, people's ability to qualify. Gotcha. Kurt, I want to kind of touch on something you mentioned earlier, give the audience a little bit of background about builders, because, you know, we know you well, but a lot of folks, we've been talking exclusively on residential. So let's kind of talk about the business, what you guys are doing, what you guys have been doing, what you're focused yeah. on, a little bit of history of builders capital for the audience. And we can talk about kind of your journey through this crazy year. I mean, what's left, right? So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so give us a little background. So I know, I know builders is focused exclusively on resi. You guys focus on construction building. Construction, uh, construction loans, but um, give us a little bit of, uh, of a history of how you guys are set up, you know, how many, how many people work for the company. Yeah, so I founded the business in 2009 after uh, 18 years in the mortgage banking business and specifically in response to the nation's largest banks exiting uh, the construction, the residential construction lending space. You know, Builders Capital, our name was chosen, you know, for a reason. We are here to serve home builders. And that now includes builder developers, because if you're a home builder today with a lack of lot supply around the nation, you almost have to be a developer, you know, as well. So our core customer is what we would refer to as a production home builder. We don't set a minimum threshold for that. Uh, we have customers that will build as few as, gosh, a half a dozen to a dozen units a year, all the way up to, in fact, our largest customer right now that I'm aware of uh, we'll put up 375 units uh, this year. So we are there to serve that market. Our core product as a result is ground up construction. Uh, we do some land acquisition development and vertical construction. Uh, in many cases, we're able to combine that into a single loan that we call an all-in-one, which makes us unique in the market. And as a result of, of being at the scale and size that we now are and pursuing greater scale, we do certainly attract some fix and flip or major renovation business and some bridge loan business. But it is certainly a minority to the volume that we do in the new construction uh, space. As far as the product itself, it's single family and predominantly for sale single family. We are working towards meeting the need in the market that's originated for buy and or build and hold. 
um, you know, i.e. rental product, which many of our larger customers uh, want to hold assets and in inventory. Um, uh, but, you know, be it condominium, townhome, row home, single family, one to four, duplex, triplex, fourplex, anything that walks or talks and smells like a single family, uh, generally speaking, falls into our, into our bucket. Uh, we, are, we are expanding right now our staff, approximately 55 uh, folks uh, within the Builders Capital family. Our loan operations are centralized uh, into our Puyallup or Tacoma area. For those of you that are not familiar with Washington State, we have a corporate office in Seattle, Washington as well. And then we have folks around the country in various markets that serve both our wholesale and retail origination channels, as well as a call center uh, here in our loan operations center as well. Uh, so we try to make ourselves very accessible to customers that may come to us through various channels uh, across the country. Very good. So can you give us an idea for, for a lot of our listeners, our lenders, and they want to kind of learn about, you know, how, you know, I guess more successful companies have built themselves or structured themselves. Kind of tell us a little bit about how you're structured. Do you guys have a fund? Do you guys, uh, you guys have a capital capital partner? Are you guys working to Wall Street? How does that, how is that, how is that set up? Yeah, a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit, all the above, Kevin, uh, which is to say, as we founded the company, uh, in 2009, we're fortunate enough, there are three partners uh, in the company, I being one of them. Uh, the, the, the gentleman that I consider to be my co-founding partner, Robert Hadley, is a real estate uh, commercial development family office. They're based here in Seattle. Uh, Robert funded the business for the first couple of years. We wanted to kind of walk the talk before we went out to raise capital. We then spent the next uh, six or seven years uh, building funds. Uh, actually, our very first customer, who is now the CEO of our company, Rob Trent, uh, uh, built a home building company, uh, started in the summer of 2008, if memory serves, by the spring of 2011, was the third largest builder in Washington State, sold his, and our first customer, uh, sold his business to a public home builder out of Denver, Richmond American Homes, became an investor in the company, became a partner in the company in 2014, and as of January this year, became the company's CEO. So it's a, it's a at, the, at the senior leadership level of our company, just as a quick detour, you have significant experience, all of which has been in the real estate space predominantly, both as operators and as developer builders, and of course, a career on my end spent in finance. With respect to our capital structure, as we came into 2018 and kind of crossed the threshold of 250 million uh, in annual fundings, and we had at that time uh, five funds, uh, 11 bank lines, uh, roughly 200 investors, the management of our capital structure became uh, a necessary but burdensome operation within, within the business. And so we began to look outward to how we might simplify our capital structure. And it was at that time that we brought on our first institutional capital partner. Um, and in fact, just closed on our second institutional capital relationship to the tune of about $500 million uh, in the last two weeks. So we are a mix of, we have always had a fund. We have felt that that was critical to our business with respect to, um, kind of as a lifeboat, if you will. In other words, uh, we have discretion over that fund. And of course, as long as we do a good job in managing those investor relationships, so on and so forth, uh, that fund has at least to date always been there. And then we look to the institutional capital markets for scale. You know, Kurt, my follow-up question on that is, you know, during COVID, you talked about that March early April time period where things were looking a little tight. <laughs> um, yeah. did, did anything happen at that point with regards to your capital structure that, that, you know, whether it was increased scrutiny or any kind of pivoting that you had to do at that point, or just even maybe increased reporting or transparency? Yeah, again, I would say, Dean, all the above. Uh, you know, I think it was an incredibly difficult, you know, they're called black swans uh, for a reason. 
Uh, I haven't done a lot of hunting and I'm pretty sure you can't hunt swans. And if you did, they wouldn't be black, right? So you never see one and those kind of events never happen. It, it, they're impossible to plan for. And I would say across the board, we had disruption uh, in the business. Um, there was a immediate conservatism, right? As to no one really knew what was gonna happen next. And, the, and we did what we felt was prudent which is we took immediate measures to um, slow down and, and in fact, pause originations while we assessed what was actually happening. To assess what's happening, you have to have data and that data always lags the reality of the marketplace, you know, at least two weeks and in some cases, 45 days. Uh, we were on the doorstep actually at that time of closing this capital relationship, which we now just closed uh, two weeks ago. And so we had to adjust, you know, for that relative to our fund. Um, we increased the frequency, particularly in the early days of communication because investors get nervous. They want to know what's going on. They want to know how we're adjusting, you know, to the business. We went through that entire, what do we want to call it? Six month period of time without a single redemption in our fund. And I credit that to the proactive work we did up front in terms of detailed communications, keeping people current, but it wasn't easy. You know, the, the cost of preserving capital, we did so by, for a period of time, again, although we didn't have any redemptions, we took measures to, to gate the fund so that we couldn't have a, a run on the bank, which is always a risk when you're, when you're managing a fund. Um, and, uh, and again, we, we dug into, uh, frankly, every file within our portfolio reached out proactively to our customers, some of which had just closed two weeks prior to even knowing that COVID was gonna be a problem and, and managed those relationships very carefully. And that was really March, April, May, June, uh, you know, timeframe. By the middle of June, uh, it was clear that the market was doing well. We began to spool back up our origination effort uh, that takes some time. Uh, we refer to that as a flywheel, and it generally takes a good 60 days to get the flywheel, you know, turning again. Closed our first loans, new loans at the end of July into August and September, and we'll probably have a record month of originations in October. Um, and Kurt, I got to ask you, is that a record month during COVID or is that all time? No, that, that, that should, you know, we're, I don't want to jinx it because we're a few days before the end of the month, but it should be an all time. Uh, record and probably by a good 30%. Wow. Wow. Really? That's crazy. And th that's all in the markets you mentioned earlier? Uh, well, I don't know that we went through a detailed uh, analysis of the markets, but 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 yes, it's diversified across our platform. So that's awesome. that's uh, awesome. Florida, uh, Colorado, uh, Idaho, significant in Idaho and Colorado, uh, to probably a lesser degree here in Washington, and to a much lesser degree in Oregon right now as a result of House Bill 214, which yeah. we don't need to spend time on. But there's some interesting constraints right now that at least at this point last through year end in Oregon. So you know how you talked about data earlier, Kurt, was there a moment during the past, I guess, six months, during the pandemic, I guess you can call it, that kind of allowed you guys to kind of, okay, the worst is behind us. Let's turn everything back on and let's go out there and, and really get after it, if you will, right? What a lot of clients tell me about, they, they're watching their, their metrics and they're watching their valuations and watching various things. Um, and I like to hear about it from both ends, right? On, on loan origination, but also for your fund. Yeah, so uh, I don't know that there was a moment, you know, I would call it more of kind of a sensation of riding on a wave, right? With the ever present, you know, concern that um, with the information or even disinformation, I would say at times that we get related to COVID, yeah. you didn't know if you were coming or going. Right. But pretty steadily starting in May, the data that would have been April data, right? March was, for the most part of the data we looked at, was really hard to assess because early March was okay. End of March was bad, but the report doesn't come out and tell you separate week by week, right? Just groups march together. April was a little bit better, but still a little bit distressed. You had to really almost look to news media, local news media, print for the most part, to determine what was happening in the moment in some of our markets. But by May, we started to get great 
data out of Metro study, even frankly, you know, free data, Zillow Redfin uh, does a pretty good job of producing data in, in micro and major markets. Um, and, and so there, again, there wasn't really a moment, but it was an initial kind of reaction like, oh my goodness, you know, the, the boat's on fire and we got to just put it out. That was probably, you know, March and early April. But by middle of May, it was like, wow, this isn't quite as bad as what we thought. And there's good indications of strength. And by mid-June, it was like, wow, now you've got two successive months of really good information. We're hearing anecdotal information on the ground of markets that are ripping. Uh, we started to do some travel uh, in June. Uh, and then again in August into some of these markets to get a feel. And like I said, by, by mid-July, uh, we had kind of our motor turned back on. But it, like I said, it takes a little bit of time for that to get spooled up. Right, right. That's and for, for the fun, I mean, what, was there, was there a, a particular, was, was it the, the increase in origination? I mean, you, I'm guessing the fund is put back to normal, not investors are not restricted anymore, or is it still, are the gates still up? What, what, no. what? No. So, uh, uh, you know, we took, a, again, a protective measure in, in quarter one. Uh, didn't turn to, out to be all that substantial. Uh, we then funded everything current with respect to investor terms based on the structure of our fund in second quarter. Uh, now, you know, anytime you kind of go to cash, which is effectively what we did in, at the end of first quarter and second quarter, that's going to have an impact on returns. Of course. Uh, but with respect to uh, raising additional dollars into the fund, we've, we've had some inbound uh, capital, you know, frankly, since June, come back into the fund. And, um, and we expect with originations now back turned on uh, that we will be able to lap up any excess that we have of capital uh, in our fund. And hopefully, you know, by the end of Q4, back, be back to a state of normalcy with respect to returns, et cetera. You, you said earlier that there was not a single redemption during the gate period and during the, during all that. And you kind of you kind of touched on it, but I like to hear more specifically, like what exactly were you communicating to your investors? Because a lot of fund managers out there, like they understand the need to be transparent and get in front of their investors and communicate more. But it's also a question of content. Like what, what information are you putting out there? Yeah, so what we tried to, do was just be, and again, particularly early on, was 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 uh, kind of set the table with facts, mm -hmm. right? Because there's so much fear, and of course now with the way media is coming at you from every device, you know, you have be a TV, computer, tablet, cell phone, um, it's way more immediate than it was, I think, you know, even 10, 15 years ago. So what we tried to do was was talk about the facts. Here is where we are from a business with respect to commitments that we've made. Here are the steps that we, here's where we are in terms of any issues with respect to the portfolio. Here's how we're managing those. Here is why we're taking the steps that we're gonna take and what that means for you. Um, and here's the importance of, and reminded people that ultimately when you get a fund into a fund like what we have and probably many of the listeners have, ultimate capital preservation is, is the key. Right when you're in a middle of a black swan event, uh, the the key is capital preservation. And so again, we tried, and I want to say it was about early on, uh, first three months of of all of this. I want to say we communicated about every three four weeks in some detail in letter form, uh, you know, to our investors. Awesome, awesome. That's that's very specific. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And Kurt, is there any changes that you have made in 2020 that you feel like, yeah, this is part of who we are now. This is how we're going to act going forward, right? We learned that and now we're going to continue that. Is there any, any habits that you might have picked up or any, any practices that you might have picked up in 2020 that you're going to carry into 2021? The blip there. Oh, sorry. A any practices in 2020 that will carry you into 2021? Like anything where you're like, yeah, now that we started doing that, we're not going back and we're going to move forward into 2021 with this new habit or this new thing that we've picked up this year. You know, I look, I, I, I think we've all, always <clears throat> had a great level of respect for the trust that people have put in us 
in placing capital, you know, in our hands, you know, to run this business. I would say that what COVID has done for us is we are let we are looking for other ways to get our product out into the market um, and manage our business versus I would say a path that we were probably on at this time last year uh, was not as conscientious as as cost, right? So people have become well accustomed to working from home offices or small uh, co-op spaces. I don't think you'll see us go out and open major real estate holdings in markets around the country where we have active boots on the ground for originations. Because again, most of the business we do is outside of our office anyway. There's a project site, there's a customer that invariably has their own office. And so I think we become much more cost uh, conscious and efficient around how we're running our business kind of top to bottom. Um, I would say that we also use that time. We did two, I think, key things during COVID. We continued to invest very, very heavily uh, in our technology. So finding better ways to improve. We have a proprietary technology that we have built uh, that manages our process from, from soup to nuts. Uh, we continued to invest in the midst of the pandemic significantly in that platform to improve uh, the customer experience uh, on the other end, from origination through servicing through draw management, made that much more user friendly. Uh, we have taken a more conservative view, even in light of the prosperity that the single family market is witnessing right now, we are more conservative in our lending standard. And I would say that we also use that time to better understand uh, the key measures within our servicing portfolio. And we are much more proactive earlier in the process and in fact, bolstered our team with respect to identifying issues early on. You know, when there's an issue, particularly in a construction loan, um, in a project, the faster you find out about it and the more proactively you deal with it, the better because time is usually not your friend uh, if things are not going well. Outstanding. That is that is really uh, top of the line best practice right there, Kurt. Um, we have just two more minutes, just one question, and then we can end with one fun question. Um, has your cost structure changed at all during COVID? Well, again, I would say our cost structure uh, has gone down uh, okay. during COVID. You know, we okay. had to get efficient um, and we did so. We, we uh, again, we were careful not to add uh, significant new leases around the country, which we were on the doorstep of doing, not in, in, in any, you know, any significant bulk, uh, but we certainly, you know, uh, had those plans on deck. Um, what about and again, your, just loan, improving what about your, our technology right. allows us to be more efficient, uh, get, frankly, get uh, more productivity out of every FTE we have in the organization. Got it, got it. And specific to your loan products, have, have those costs go, gone down at all to, to your customers? Uh, do you mean specific to our loan products with respect to uh, rates? Have, have your rates, have your rates and fees gone more? up? Have they gone down? Because with COVID, the trend, the trend was folks were raising their rates and lowering their LTVs, getting more conservative. Things seem to lose, be loosening up just a touch, not completely back to where we were last year. Is that the same for you, Kurt? Or, or were you guys able to kind of re retain a, a level of stability there? Yeah, I would say we've maintained a level of, of, of you know, stability. I mean, look, if our capital cost goes up, then our cost has to go up, you know, to our end user. But we were careful uh, to, to hold the line. Uh, and in fact, our pursuit is always to deliver better, you know, cheaper, faster product to our customers. That's how we believe we'll win and gain market share. Uh, so we, we did bring down our, our loan products are slightly more conservative than they were probably this time last year, uh, you know, 5%, you know, here and there. But with respect to cost, no, I would not say. Uh, in fact, to the contrary, with the new capital that we've brought on board, uh, I think you'll find we're more competitive than most in the market. Outstanding, Kurt. This has been fantastic. Uh, no surprise that that Builders Capital is a successful organization. You do 
what all the good organizations do and pivot and change and, and act rapidly in, in this, uh, this black swan event that we've all been living in. And our last question, we just want to end on, you know, let's have some fun. What has been your, what has been your vice to get you through uh, this COVID time that we're living in? <laughs> What's getting you through this? Like the day to day is so mundane. How are you, how are you making it happen, Kurt? Well, I've probably tied. I'm 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 a fly fisherman only by statement. You wouldn't know it based on looking at my calendar, but I've probably tied about five or six hundred flies uh, during uh, COVID time. So that's how I've, uh, particularly in the early days when Washington was locked down, did a lot of fly tying. Abs, uh, that is awesome. That's a great, great tip. Uh, I'm sure you got a lot of time and a lot of deep thoughts in during during yeah, that's that time. Right. All right. Well, we're to the end of it, of our very first um, insight into the marketplace for private lenders. Thank you so much to Kurt, our, our guest today. Kevin, thank you for joining us. And this has been great. We'll see everyone again uh, next month. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and contact us. And we'll share that information here. And um, we look forward to seeing everybody again. Kevin, anything else? No, thank you very much, uh, Kurt. It was great to have you for this uh, this uh, interview and uh, hope to uh, uh, see you around again and we will do another one pretty soon. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate it. Have an awesome day. All right, guys. Everyone take care. Take care.